Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this Women in Agribusiness Today interview. My name is Michelle Marshall, and I am the managing editor of our Women in Ag Today blog and the newsletter. Today joining us is Dr. Temple Grandin, who is an animal behaviorist, an autism activist, and a distinguished professor at the Colorado State University. She has joined us in the past at our 2018 Women in Agribusiness Summit, where she was keynote speaker, and she has gratefully agreed to be at our summit this fall in September out in Denver, and she will be exclusive to our Women in Agribusiness members at the Members Only Night, which will be off-site at the CSU Spur campus. Uh, during that special night, uh, attendees will see a private screening of uh, Temple's new documentary called An Open Door. There will also be a book signing for Temple's book, Visual Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in, in um, Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions. And there'll also be a Q&A session that will feature Temple and the film's producer, as well as Amy Parsons, who is the president of Colorado State University. So thank you for joining us, Temple, and um, welcome. It's good to be here. We have quite a few questions for you today, so we'll get going with that. Okay. Uh, so um, we last talked in 2018 when we were at our event in Denver. In that time, you've written a book and filmed a documentary. Um, what initiatives do you have underway in animal ag, perhaps at CSU um, and in the cattle industry directly? Well, I'm continuing to teach my class in livestock handling. I've been, been at CSU since 1990, and it makes me really happy when I have a student in my class where I explain something like a little movement pattern for moving a herd of cattle out on pasture. And he looked at my PowerPoint slides. I explained how the movement pattern worked. And he went out on his ranch with his horse and he made it work. The other cowboys thought it was crazy at first, but then they saw that it worked. And I'm really interested in, in communicating with young people. Um, we've got a lot of lo new young people coming into the industry. And so we still always have to just talk about handling basics because that's um, brand new information to somebody who's new. Things like the flight zone, the point of balance. I've got a website, brandon.com, where I have uh, lots of just basic information on handling. I've got a book on cattle handling, Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. Just basic. And then I got to show you, I've made a compilation of all my best journal articles. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. And, but we still always have to talk to new people coming into the industry about just the basic principles. Uh, sometimes people say to me, well, Temple talks about the same stuff. Well, the new people, you have to talk about the same stuff. Exactly. And I always try to put some new information in along with it. Wonderful. And there's always new new faces that you're talking to anyway. That's so right. you need to start and get the foundation for them. Yeah, um, I'm going to be, you know, the uh, North American Media Institute's having their animal welfare conference coming up. And I'm going to be doing a talk just on very basic uh, cattle, uh, handling of cattle, pigs, and sheep. Just the, the behavior basics. Excellent. Um, so now in your documentary, An Open Door, you speak a lot about mentors, which have been very pivotal in your path in life. Uh, at Women in Ag, we're, we are really true to mentors too and helping with your career and such. Can you give a few examples of, of how you feel that has helped you on your oh, path? Yeah, mentors are really, really important. I had a great science teacher. When I was in high school, I was a goofball student. I didn't care about studying. Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, showed me if I study, that's a pathway to becoming a scientist. So when I stopped goofing off and I started studying, Another important mentor when I first started in the industry was a contractor named Jim Uo. And he'd seen some of my designs and seeked me out. And he showed me how to set up a business. Um, I made my own self-made internship at the Swift plant. And Norb Goskowitz, the plant superintendent, was another important mentor. Um, you know, these people helped me. And there were a lot of good people in the industry. Now, early in my career, starting in the 70s in the Arizona feed yards, being a woman uh, was a much bigger barrier than autism was. And there were good people that helped me and they were mostly the upper management people that were really helpful. 
Where I had trouble was with the middle managers, the foremans. They're the ones who didn't like having me there. This weird girl nerd coming out there and telling them how to handle cattle. Hmm. That's great. And and building on that, you, I mean, you've worked decades in the industry. And, and like you said, it was more of a barrier being a woman than being autistic. How do you think the industry has improved or changes made, you know, to help usher more women into the sector? And oh, it, there's lots and lots of women now. Yeah. Lots and lots of women now uh, doing quality assurance, uh, plant manager for beef plant. i uh, you know, lots more women, though there's so many more opportunities now. And do you think they're much better received than <laughs> you had a, in the 1970s? There, There's more open doorways for them? Oh, I think so. I think definitely. There's still some discrimination. But, uh, yeah, there's many more doorways open now. And the thing is, what people want now is somebody that's motivated. They want motivated people. I was just out in a construction site where they're building a new beef plant. And I saw a lot of young people out there. I was glad to see it because I'm really concerned in the in the building industry of uh, old people retiring out. Well, this company's really working hard on training young people. You know what the number one thing they want? And I agree with them. Motivation. Motivation. That I, I person has to be motivated to work because one of the problems right now after COVID, it's uh, knocked the wind out of quite a few students and they're just not as motivated to work. I have a lot more problems now getting students to talk in class. Boy, you know, I just have to point to them and make them talk in class. Mm. You know, they much more to themselves and there's been some problems with work ethic. I've, I've talked to a number of different professors, okay, in my university, but also at other universities. I think it would be really hard for a young person to have their high school graduation canceled, their college graduation canceled. and Right, right. And they're so... Um electronically focused for communication that I think the face-to-face -face is is getting more difficult f for them just well, they don't want to they don't want to do phone calls and there's still a place for you know face to face because I find that when you go and you go places face to face I'm learning things I would never learn on zoom yes zooms enabled me to talk to many more people I had a wonderful talk with people in Brazil today about autism just basic things on treatment for young children and things like that. Um, but on the other hand, you can't do everything on Zoom. Right. And I know many businesses are trying to get people back into the office, but the office buildings in the downtown big cities are half vacant. That, that they don't like that very much. I think there's some jobs you can truly just do remote, but jobs what, that involve collaboration. There needs to be some in-person collaboration because you go into the office and then you find out somebody's doing the such and such project and then you get involved in it. And exactly. you wouldn't have those hallway conversations if you didn't go into the office. Agreed. Yeah, I think face-to-face -face is it's very important for sure. And obviously we host conferences that that's the main purpose is to get people together in a room as, as many as possible to network and get the information shared. Well, um, I think it's important for students to go to conferences. Yes, it's really important, and and we do welcome them at ours with our we have student scholarships, so that that's right. That is 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 helpful, and we usually have uh, twenty to thirty young ladies there. So, well, it, that's good. That is just wonderful. Say. Now, um, at the event when you will be with our members only, um, that you're going to be signing your book, Visual Thinking. I yes, know you I'll have... be signing Visual Thinking, and this is it right here, and I will be signing. And I think you have 25 books or more that you've worked on. Well, not quite 25 books. So I've got more like maybe 15. And why this book was chosen um, to give away and, and what was... Well, the reason why I'm really interested in this book is I'm very concerned about skill loss. Hmm. Uh, before COVID, I went to a state-of-the-art pork plant, a state-of-the-art um, chicken plant. Uh, in fact, I went to two pork plants and all the equipment's coming in from Holland now. Beef, we actually still know how to build. And I was just down on one uh, of Schmeckley Construction's projects. And uh, he's got lots of young people he seeks out and he's training. So that we don't forget how to learn, forget how to build a beef plant. And uh, there are lots of great young ladies there too. Really happy to see that. That's and great. We've seen- They were telling me that the work. number one trait is motivation. We yeah. want to learn. Right. Uh, what, and what do they say? 99% of life is just showing up. So 
<laughs> or Edison said 99% in 99% perspiration, right? percent inspiration. Right. Um, now you've done lots and lots of work with um, autism and, you know, just with your own background and overcoming many different things. And I, I was reading in some of your stuff that you use um, teachable moments with, with the children. Yes, that's right. As finding what they're good at and, and what they like, and then you use that to help teach them. Do, do you see a way as adults we can use that like with our careers? And Well, that was done with me. And I had some people that, um, you know, that counseled me. And on my very first project, I criticized some welding. And I said it looked like pigeon doo-doo. <laughs> and the plant engineer, so the Swift plant, pulled me into his office. And he didn't scream and yell at me. He explained to me what I should do. This was a teachable moment. And that uh, the welder, his name was Whitey, he was up in the cafeteria and I need to go up and apologize. He told me what I should do. He also explained the chain of command that Whitey was his employee and I should have come to him if I didn't like the welding. You see, that's telling me what I should do. He was the perfect job coach. That's an example of a grown up teachable moment. And I think it falls in line too with mentors because that's, right. that's, that's what they do as well. You, you might have a vision, but because they've been in the industry or the sector or the job longer, they can show you. It, it's like being a parent, honestly, but children don't listen to their parents. So <laughs> hopefully yeah, they listen right. more to mentors. <laughs> um, that's but that's great. an example of a teachable moment, you know, for an adult. And now, what advice would you give to women who are thinking about maybe coming into agriculture or accelerating their career? Um, do you see promise in certain sectors for, for women in ag or different areas that make more sense? Well, I recommend, first of all, if they're a college student, let's major in animal science. Mm -hmm. But what you also need to do is a volunteer and to help um, other professors with the research projects, because then you can often get out of plants, farms, and, and different places, uh, get a chance to do career relevant internships. I'm a big believer in trying on a career. You want to find out what you love, but you also might find out, I tried that on and I would absolutely hate it. Okay, like working in a micro food safety lab all day, it's an important job, but I would get bored. Another person gonna love that job, but you don't know until you try it. You know, students that want to be veterinarians, I say, yeah, shadow a veterinarian. Find out exactly what they do. And sometimes what they're imagining a job is going to be like isn't the reality of the job. So I'm a big fan of trying on jobs. And students, when they're in college, need to participate in all kinds of activities in the department. And there's a tendency now for some students to be shy and rather retreat to their electronic devices than maybe help out serve the barbecue for the freshman students or... Uh, uh, go down to the Denver Stock Show and uh, man the CSU booth. Because also when you do these activities, you meet people that would get you connections to get into um, seeing a lot more stuff and participating in a lot more stuff. Because if you can kind of try on a job, I think that's really a good thing to do. Yeah, and there's a lot of opportunity too if you just... If you're in college and you look around campus, the internships and the available businesses locally and things oh, like that. There's all kinds of stuff and they need to be doing it. Mm -hmm. Because you do, too often I've heard, oh, parents made their kid become a doctor and they hated it. Well, you want to avoid that. Now, I'm not going to say that everything that happens at work is going to be absolutely wonderful, but you want to go into a job where you're going to like the type of work you're doing. Exactly. And and trying it on is, is a really good way to realize that it's something i write and i tell this to all students i don't care what major they are or any student that comes to me i tell them that you know volunteer to help professors collect data for their research then you're trying on what some of the research is about right exactly um well um, i'd like to switch gears a little bit and just ask you some industry questions industry if that's okay with you okay that's um, fine so regarding animal welfare what are your thoughts on the recent um, incidences in bird flu, particularly now that it's detected in cattle as well as other animals and such? What, what impact or what are your thoughts on, you know, as far as animal science background, the impact? Well, of I this? think it's concerning. You know, the dairy worker got infected. Now, I was just reading in science this morning that it was a separate strain 
We are very concerned if it got into pigs. It's killed a lot of different wildlife animals. It's mm -hmm. killed a lot of different wild birds. Uh, it's very concerning. And uh, we, we're probably going to have to think about vaccinating a lot of animals. Yes. We're going to probably have to end up doing that. That's and I was reading here, but that's probably what we're going to end up having to do. Yeah, because everyone talks about they don't want that stuff in their milk or their or their beef. Well, I was reading in science again this morning. I get science and nature on. That's my breakfast pleasure reading. Mm -hmm. And the the uh, bird flu virus tends to um, have an affinity for the uh, udder and the mammary gland. And yes, and I know it's concerning. And the thing you always worry about is mutation. I'm. Um, they're worried about it getting into pigs because they can serve as a reservoir for jumping species barriers. Right. And I was reading about um, a lab that they're working to um, take some healthy cows in and inject them with the virus and then really examine how it spreads, bring in some healthy cows and, and see yeah. how it moves forward so they can. I think another thing we got to look at, I recently looked at a paper on pig genetics and uh, they were looking at, you know, different countries have different indigenous breeds of pigs they might be super hardy they might be super fertile and have tons of little piglets but one of the things that some of these uh, older lines of genetic lines of animal have is disease resistance mm -hmm. see right now we've bred our animals so much for the meat milk or the eggs i like to look at genetic selection like this animals is like a national budget so if i put everything into the economy meat milk or eggs i'm probably going to shortchange the infrastructure that's the bone the heart the reproduction, and am I shortchanging the military? That's the ability to fight off disease. Maybe you have to give up a little bit of production and breed some military back in. Right. I'm, not, I'm just saying this in a very general sort of manner because the other thing I'm getting very concerned about, we've done a really good job of getting the meatpacking plants working, just great. I was very involved with that. Yes. But now the problem I'm seeing started happening in about the last 15 years is more and more cattle coming in late coming in with difficulty walking. And I think a big uh, a factor in this is genetics. We're breeding so much for meat that they've got very poor leg and foot conformation. Maybe a collapsed ankle, too post-legged. Um, but a recent survey that my colleague, Lily Edwards Calloway, my former student did, she went to five um, large fed beef plants, 8% of the cattle were lame. In mm. other words, a uh, big number. mildly lame. Um, another plant, at 32% lame cattle, that's not something to be proud of. Because mm -hmm. one of the things about being an old lady is I can remember 20 years ago when in feedlot fed cattle, there was no lame cattle. It was almost zero. Mm. Unless you had an injury, you know, where the leg actually got injured. Right. It was almost zero. But young people coming in today are going to think this is normal. No, this is an example of bad becoming normal. Because I've been in the industry 50 years, and for 30 of those years, <laughs> cattle walked around on concrete just fine, and the young fed beef were not lame, except for an occasional injury, maybe an occasional foot rod. But you would not find 8% of the cattle lame in five plants of fed beef 20 years ago. So I'm real concerned about that. The animals are also um, heavier at a younger age, Another problem that's crept up is congestive heart failure, mm -hmm. where one of the latest studies showed that 4% um, of big fat feedlot cattle were in late stage congestive heart failure. They managed to get up the ramp at the plant mm -hmm. and not die in the yards, <laughs> but their hearts were in very, very bad condition. This is something that's gotten worse. It's slowly gotten worse over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. No, we've, we've got to start, we're going to probably have to breed some hardiness in there. Um, so when I see a problem now in welfare at a meatpacking plant, it's often something we're going to have to fix at the farm. Now, another problem we're having is very tall cattle. I uh, don't fit in the bottom deck of the cattle truck very well. They bang their back coming out. Wow. And now, this maybe, is... we got a, maybe we got them too big. See, the problem you got with this big right. steer. So the meat industry wants a giant big steer. The problem with the giant big steer is it has a giant sister. And out on these uh, ranches, uh, you're going to go broke trying to feed a gigantic cow all winter. Mm -hmm. You're going to just go broke. And what a rancher needs is a much more moderate sized cow. 
and you can't make the trucks higher. You've got a weight, uh, a height limitation in the Eastern United States. Right. So it's about well, protection. We need to breed a smaller animal so they don't hit their back. Uh, and maybe the problem is what we put in the trail. Let's put a smaller cow in there and it's not going to hit its back. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. See, you breed an animal for more meat or more eggs or whatever. From a sustainability standpoint, that's good because you got less cattle or less chickens to make the same amount of protein. But there's a problem when you overload the system and things start to fall apart. Mm -hmm. The problem is this happens slowly and people don't realize it until uh, you're really starting to get a mess. Right. So, so that's what I see in the future. But another thing I think we need to be really working on in the future is educating the public that grazing animals definitely have a place and uh, they can improve the environment. This is a paper I wrote on grazing cattle, sheep and goats can be part of a sustainable agricultural future. And you take Eastern Colorado, hundred miles to Eastern Colorado. All you can do is graze that land. Right. If you don't graze it, you can't raise food on it. Mm -hmm. If you do grazing right with rotational grazing, you can actually improve land. And everybody's saying, look at all the greenhouse gas that cattle put out. Now, there's other things that put a lot of methane out. They're just starting to measure landfills and dumps. It's right. not pretty. And it's probably right. going to be more than what cattle put out. Right. And along those lines, we have the proliferation of alternative meats. Where do you think, where do you see those fitting into the larger protein market as global demand for protein grows, as well as people looking for alternatives that have less environmental impact. How do you think that's going to affect the, um, you know, the meat market? Well, you have to look at your energy inputs coming in. And when you really start looking at it, it may not be as good as what they might think it is. Mm -hmm. Let's look at things like AI right now. Nobody realized the massive amounts of electricity it takes to run warehouses full of computers to power chat GPT right. and other AI things. I just read a thing about the uh, that drug that prevents you get fat. That oh, is that, that environmentally has a really lot of nasty chemicals to make that drug. Right. I. Um, I the thing is, it made cultivated meat made in bioreactors. So I'm, you're not going to make a steak in a bioreactor. You make more of like a tofu type product or something like that. But can it scale? True. They haven't been able to make the, that process scale yet up to big. The other thing is keeping disease out of it. And then what do you feed it? Well, right now they feed it blood. Hmm. You now you got to find a substitute for that. Yeah, I think you scale... have to look at any process. You have to look at what you feed it. Like right now, everybody's all gung ho biofuels. We're going to make clothing out of sugar. We're going to fuel planes on with garbage with mushrooms. I get a magazine called chemical and engineering news. And yes, we can do that, but you couldn't grow enough corn. You couldn't uh, grow enough crops to feed every airplane. There's no way. Right now we are putting for about roughly 44% of our total corn crop into ethanol right now. That's going on right now. Mm. Some of these things, okay, we're going to make clothing out of sugar or whatever. Well, you have to grow that sugar. It almost yeah. adds an extra step. That well, I, yeah, but you always have to look at, uh, I'm a visual thinker, where I think totally visually. And in my visual thinking book, I talk about how I think in pictures. So a person who thinks in pictures sees the solution to a problem or sees a problem. Then you have the mathematical calculating people. Okay, they're the chemists that make the magical thing that can turn sugar into a Western shirt, let's say, or turn it into a ski. I went to a factory where they were doing that. I'm um, just great. Not, that's for the mathematicians to do. But somebody like me needs to look at where are we going to get the feed stock, the raw material you feed into the process. Okay, you can. I, I saw a menu of all the stuff I can feed an airplane. Palm oil. You don't feed palm oil to airplanes. You can feed them garbage with about 15% corn. That will work. Planes already flown on that. Yep. Prancing out there with his wild hair, the paddle <laughs> going like this, bringing his plane in. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But that, 
they yeah there's a certain amount of biofuel we can do but biofuel can get really unsustainable really quickly because where do you get the feedstock the material you feed into the process that I, supply chain i understand right and this is magic box i put it in that's for the chemists and the mathematicians mm -hmm. but where would you grow enough corn you know, right, right now, 44, I think it's either 43, 44 percent. It's a big amount of corn goes into ethanol and then another big amount goes into um, animal feed and a little bit goes into corn chips and tortillas and that kind of stuff. So along those lines, do you think alternative meats? Um, I mean, they're obviously meeting with some resistance now, uh, you know, and, and, and we have to figure out more about, like you said, the inputs. What, what happens there? How can we get that up to scale if that's going to... Well, you see, you got to look at what you feed it. Every process has inputs. Mm -hmm. And I've got, um, oh, I've got what's upstairs, my my things that really show the environmentally bad stuff, like manufacture some of these drugs, like nasty solvents they have to use. They're trying mm -hmm. to figure out a greener way to make these weight loss drugs. Right. You see, and this is where the visual thinker can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Chemist makes the process. Right. But someone like me is going, where am I going to get enough raw materials to make this drug or, or to make, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, now, there are some people playing around with uh, feeding uh, a, a soldier fly larva as a yeah. protein source. Right, right. And that's something that might be a lot more scalable. You've got to get over the ick factor. <laughs> but, but, you know, maybe that's more scalable. And along those lines, uh, we see a lot of ag tech innovation for, you know, just in the industry in general, but for example, in cattle, there's cow collars now or yeah, virtual, virtual fence. In fact, I've been, or, in, I had a chance to go with uh, John, oh, I can't remember, pronounce his last name, with mm -hmm. Vance or, or the Merck virtual fence. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, last year I went up with them on a forest service land and they were using the virtual fence to keep cattle out of the riparian areas along the fragile stream areas. And the way it works, it's like an invisible fence for a dog. And the cow gets a beep if she gets too close to the boundary, and then she learns to stay away from the boundary, and it works off of GPS. Mm -hmm. And there's probably five or six companies now around the world making it. Now, mm -hmm. I can see some really great uses for this on, on rotational grazing in very, very extensive areas. Now, there's been some controversy. I've had a lady call me up from New Zealand that there was a company trying to herd cows into the milking parlor with this. I would recommend not doing that because I have observed with regular electric fence with the strings, just using the wires or the strings, Yes. that you do it in too small a pen. Cattle get stressed out because they're always watching their backside. Oh, because they hit well, it by yeah, accident. They're always watching the backside. They're going to hit it accidentally. Mm -hmm. Where you put it in, you know, let's say you're doing strip, strip grazing where you just move forward. They they know how to stay away from it. You see, what's stressful is unpredictable shock. So trying to herd them with it, especially in tight, small areas, like going to milking parlor, I would not recommend that. Using it out in pasture. Because I can see that as a technology that could really, really help with grazing. Because we have 20% of the world's land that can be only grazed. But we've got to uh, do it with rotational grazing that when you do it right, and I discussed this in the paper that I did two years ago, reviewed a lot of literature, mm -hmm. a lot of references in this, on ways to do rotational grazing, grazing animals on cover crops, um, that, you know, so you might do corn, soy, and then a cover crop, getting animals and the crops back together. Mm -hmm. See, there's a lot of very sustainable things we can do with a grazing animal as part of the solution to the problem. Yeah, and I think um, these ag tech innovations are are helpful for the most part, and um, probably most not too stressful to the animal. Um, but we have to use it right. And I was very concerned about trying to herd cattle with this in tight, small areas. Uh, the other problem is the GPS barrier is not that accurate. Mm. They, you know, there's the, uh, right now. I'm trying to get an engineering report on how weather and all kinds of weird things, the ionosphere or whatever, can change the accuracy of the GPS signal, but they're not that accurate. So let's say I'm moving moving cattle out in a big pasture, it doesn't matter if it's 20 feet off, mm. they can just, or 10 feet off or three feet off. Uh, but if I'm trying to move them into a milking parlor and it's 10 feet off, cows are gonna get their backside sapped and they're not gonna get their neck sapped and they're not gonna like that. Right, right. You see, you see, you see that they learn the routine then the stress levels are really low. And there's been some research done on uh, cortisol in the manure or in the urine. They can be really low. And 
and uh, I'm a big proponent of, of rotational grazing because what do we do with the 20% of the land that cannot be cropped? Eastern mm -hmm. Colorado is a good example. You're not going to crop that. Sand Hills of Nebraska, Flint Hills of Kansas. I've visited those lands, Flint Hills of Nebraska, that rock that far below the below below the grass and you can see it when they make the cut throughs for the highways you can see it yeah not too many nutrients in that <laughs> well they're grazing it on um, but there's a uh, see grazing is something that's really part of a sustainable future and of course bison also people are using them um, and there's a lot of good things this is a magazine i really like the grass farmer okay Stop the grass farmer Mm -hmm. uh, it does not have much of a presence online. You've got to get the old fashioned paper copy, but you have a lot of innovators and sometimes some young people that are innovators doing very innovative things. Because you've got to remember in every industry, little people innovate. Mm -hmm. Big people copy, little people innovate. Yes. Look at all the companies. Google started out in the dorm room. Right and Same develop Facebook. a page rank idea, which is similar to academic citation. Mm -hmm. And that um, uh, where you, you, the websites that get more links got more hits. That was just two people in a dorm room. I mean, this is where little people do the innovation. Right. And there were some very innovative stuff that, you know, where people are talking about what they do on their farms in here. And Stripe, what do you see? As um, some of the more sustainable and regenerative ag practices out there that are that are helping both with cattle and cropping, um, I mean, there's well, basically the rotational grazing, right? Where you do it correctly, where basically when the herds of bison came across the plains, they would bunch together, eat down a bunch of the grass, mow it by half, then move. Mm -hmm. so what you do is you tightly, fairly tightly bunch, mow by half, then move them. You don't let them rip it out of the ground. And then you don't bring them back to that patch of ground until it's completely regenerated. Great. Yeah, yeah. And you also have to make sure the root system regenerates because that regenerates more slowly than the green part of the plant. Right. You then gotta you get your solar green. panels on it there to help get the uh, roots to get regenerated. Great. Um, now, just in as far as in the industry, you have been a visionary. Uh, and revolutionizing the cattle industry and helping map out the future for you know where things went. W what do you see coming coming new that might help really? I mean, because what you worked with with the the cattle shoots and and you know humane treatment of them really made a great impact in the well, industry. Well, we have we really let's talk about the good things. We have really improved cattle handling. Yes, well, NCBA and the various different companies have sponsored all kinds of low stress cattle handling workshops. Cattle handling is way improved, way improved. They meat plants. When I first worked with them back in 1999, they were a mess, broken stunners, busted stuff. And then what I worked on implementing in 1999 is I taught McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's how to use a very simple scoring system that I developed. And when you had those big customers enforcing it, you made change. I had lots of equipment already out there, lots of good equipment. Mm -hmm. My clients tore it up and wrecked it. And then in 1999, we got, I had very simple scoring. You had to be unconscious when you hung them on the rail, 95% first shot unconscious efficacy on stunning, on uh, no more than 1% falling anywhere in the facility, no more than three cattle out of 100 mooing in the stun box area. And you had to get 75% move with no electric prod and no acts of abuse. Very simple outcome-based metric. They totally understand. And I spent five years going around um, from 1999 until about 2005, going around to all these places all the time. And one of the things I did that made it work is I practiced reverse conflict of interest. I had expensive things I could sell. I bent over backwards not to sell them. Mm -hmm. And out of 74 plants, only three had to buy expensive stuff. Hopelessly oh, okay, so you can just yeah, only three plants had to buy expensive stuff. The rest of them we fixed with uh, stunner maintenance and repairs, and then putting on a really good stunner repair program, uh, non-slip flooring put in high traffic areas, that's uh, capital expense, lighting, moving smaller groups of animals, training handlers, a whole lot of little things like that added up to big thing. That's some yep. one of the things I'm the most proud of. So we got the plants working just great. Right. 
Then we started having lameness creeping in there. Slowly, mm -hmm. Very slowly. And but now we've got a lot of lameness. That you see because you see in pictures. So when you go into a plant, you can you can visualize as if the animal is seeing and, and help make those changes for them. Well, and I see it. Now, what I find, see, because I talk about in my book, the visual thinker thinks in pictures, the pattern mathematical thinker, mm -hmm. and then you have your word thinker who thinks in words. And what I have found to help the word thinkers find the things, I give them checklists of things to look for, reflections, mm -hmm. coats on fences, um, a sun in their eyes, mm -hmm. seeing equipment moving up ahead. I have to give them checklists. But when I'm when I first started this, I didn't know that other people didn't think in in pictures. But a picture thinker can just see a solution to a problem. Right. Yeah, and then it just it, it's very interesting and in one of your um your 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 quotes, I guess, that has helped with all the decisions for your books is that the world needs all different kinds of well, things. Well, yes, because let's talk about the sustainability issues. Um, okay, how they make garbage into airplane fuel, that is for the um, mathematicians. Right. And I'm going to be looking at, do we have enough garbage? We still have to feed it 15% corn. Mm -hmm. The plane doesn't like a diet of pure garbage. <laughs> because I've actually looked up the diets I can feed the planes. And then it's up to the mathematicians to make the process. But somebody right. has to say, we can't grow enough corn to, uh, or enough sugar to make all the clothing out of sugar. Right. Right. Because when I went to the company, I went to a company that was making skis, beautiful skis and snowboards. And they were using a process with algae to make, um, you know, this is the magic of a chemistry black box. Mm -hmm. But then I said, keep asking about the feed stock. Okay, what do you feed that process? You basically feed it sugar. Sugar cane, beet sugar, corn syrup, sugar. Mm -hmm. You always have an ultimate feedstock you have to put into that system to make the material. That's where the hang up is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I brought that up, it wasn't real popular. Let's put it that way. Well, you've been very good at bringing ideas that weren't so popular and making making them work. So uh, we know that's a well. One of the things I think that we can do a lot of good stuff on is grazing. Really, and you see on the uh, virtual fencing, mm -hmm. it, it's going to make it so much easier to do the grazing. You know, because you get out on this extensive rangeland, it's going to be hard to just be moving electric strings around all the time to move cattle. Right, right. I think, but it has to be used right. It has to be used right, and and I'm adamant that you don't use it for herding animals in small places like going into milking parlors. Let's not use it for that. Right. You know, let's use it out in the open country, or you can use it strip grazing. It'll work for that because the animals know to when to move ahead. And now we did touch upon it a little bit, and it wasn't in my initial questions for you, but there's a lot of discussion about how much um, methane and carbon dioxide that you know the cattle industry produces. But like you were saying, I think if you look at other industries, like just measuring what landfills produce, that oh, landfills, I mean, this weight loss drug, I mean, it, it, it puts out a lot of bad stuff. There's a lot of other stuff that's putting out stuff. I mean, yeah, cattle put out some methane. Right. But what about swamps? They put out a lot of methane. Mm -hmm. They're natural. Right. How about leaking oil field equipment? That you have to just, that's maintenance. Mm -hmm. That's maintenance, uh, right. leaking oil field equipment. Right. Um, but um, wastewater treatment plants put out methane. And these are just starting to be measured now. There's a new satellite that's gone up that will measure um, some of these methane sources. But I think dumps are going to be big. Why did they put those little pipes in the landfill? Methane right. comes out of those. Right, right. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that um, we'll always have the meat connoisseur. And, you know, maybe there'll be a mix in there with some alternative options. But I think they can um, live together in harmony. Well, and, and, the, uh, and then I think a lot more integrated stuff, because let's say if I'm grazing a cover crop, the cattle fertilize it, and then I don't have to use so much Roundup. See, I think the, in the future, the sensible, sustainable thing to do is mostly organic with a little bit of regular. 
-hmm. I had a very progressive farmer to say to me, he had a beautiful farm, really sustainable. Don't be too pure. You know, and 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 it's going to take time for people to learn how to use these systems. I mean, some foreign country just all of a sudden decided to make the country all organic and they about starved. Well, that's crazy doing that. Right. But kind of a hybrid approach where mostly organic, but you still use a little bit of regular. You're going to need it. Right. That would be the sensible thing to do. But yeah. I've talked to people that have done cover crops and they've told me that the amount of Roundup they had to use, they cut it down 90%. You see, you don't ban it. You just cut it down a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. The kind of things that are going to be, be sensible. And working with your systems and just experimenting. And we have to, you know, and, and there's a lot of young people coming in. Young people can be the innovators because the little guys innovate. Look at what's happened with ChatGPT. That was a little tiny company mm -hmm. that invented ChatGPT. A single graduate student, some of those boxes I've got underneath the desk here, they have a paper that a graduate student wrote a number, a number of years ago. That's the basic computer programming system for artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Graduate student in his childhood bedroom. Paper has something like 20,000 citations. Never finished his PhD. <laughs> and the coding idea was the basis of artificial intelligence. Little okay. guys innovate. And little I... girls innovate too, I should be saying. Right, right. The right. little people innovate. Yes. I don't care what industry it is. I mean, look what happened to Kodak. Right. They invented a digital camera and they let themselves just die. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you'll find at our event when, when in the fall that you'll be able to meet with some of the young innovators who do come to our event and will join us at the members only night out. Uh, so that will be a, a nice thing for them to meet you and hear your thoughts. Okay, that sounds really good. And and I'm sure they'll have ideas that they'll want to share with you. Um, what I would do now, what I'd like to do now, is is leave our Women in Ag Today audience with a few of your um, guidelines for for life that I've 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 plucked. Oh, I see you different... put those right there. Yeah, I, I and then, I'll one just... of the things I learned. Especially since I was a weird a lady, weird nerd, is I learned <laughs> to sell my work rather than myself. I would simply show people what some of my drawings look like. Yes. And I learned to sell my work. This is really important. Sell my work rather than selling myself. So I'd show off my drawings. I'd show off pictures. That's what I did. And I shouldn't mm -hmm. have these here to here to show you, right? can't find them in my mess right now. But yeah, they're very impressive. I was looking at some of the drawings that you did for the original cattle shoots and such was very amazing. Okay, here are some of my drawings right here in my book, Thinking and Pictures. Okay, yep. I very learned to sell my work instead of myself. And the other thing is we do need to give animals a decent life. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very concerned. Somebody showed me a picture on the phone just the other day with some very filthy, dirty feedlot cattle, covered okay. all of their backs and everything in manure. Oh, that's not okay. Absolutely not okay. That's not a life worth living to be rolling in that much poop. I won't use the swear word for it. Right. <laughs> that's not okay. Uh, right. The other thing is everywhere I go and every meeting I go or every place I go, I always learn something new. Always try to learn new things. Now, this says, don't let autism define you. Now, autism is a very important part of who I am. But for me, career comes first. I'm a college professor first, a scientist, a behavior person first. And yes, I have friends in the autism community. Yes, I participate in the autism community. But the happiest people who are autistic have interesting careers. And when I was out in the plants all the time, working with um, uh, you know various metal shops that I worked with, well, about 20% of them were autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And I just visited this construction site just a couple of days, just yesterday, actually. And uh, uh, I, we talked about that. And they said, well, we probably got a bunch of those on this job, too. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a skill loss issue because the shops I worked with are retiring out. And one thing that's really good at doing in this construction company is trying to find really energetic young people that they can train. 
so that we don't forget how to build a beef plant. We've already forgotten how to build a pork plant, a chicken plant. We got to buy that stuff. Hundred shipping containers from Holland per plant. Mm -hmm. We also don't make the state-of-the-art electronic chip making machine. It's from Holland. Okay. This goes back to taking shop classes out. The other thing is, I said special ed builds the stuff. And I've said in a lot of meetings, in my generation, the special ed kids owned the shops. They owned the shops. Mm -hmm. Well, now they won't let them take shop because they're too worried about the insurance. Find out what you both like and hate. We talked about that. I recommend that people do that. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Do something that makes the world a better place. One thing about a visual thinker and a mathematical thinker, it's a much more bottom-up kind of thinking. You work on something specific because people will say to me, well, how did you, how did you make such a difference in the cattle industry? I started out working on something specific, cattle handling. I didn't just say, well, the whole world's terrible. I don't know. I can't fix the whole world. Mm -hmm. But I worked on cattle handling, something that was specific. And where we need the different kinds of thinkers, let's go back to the beef plant or the food processing plant. My kind of mind builds the, what I call the clever engineering, all of the mechanically complicated devices. That's us. The mathematicians do the refrigeration. I'm now seeing on a wooden, big wooden pallet, a bright blue piece of complicated looking equipment. And I asked what it's for. That's refrigeration mm -hmm. equipment. That's right. for the mathematicians. Because the people I work with, and I work for every major meat company, they didn't touch refrigeration. Right. So that blue thing that was on the pallet, that's the, and I'm seeing it now as we talk, and it was bright blue. It was the color of my, was the color of my uh, young reader's edition of visual thinking, different kinds of minds, the color of this book. And not the mathematicians deal with that piece of equipment. That requires more in mathematics. So you want a food processing plant, any kind of a food processing plant. You're going to need the people like me who are terrible at higher math, and you're going to need the mathematicians. You need both. Yep. That, um, then you need the verbal thinkers out there to sell the product and run the business. Right. It's it's a good it's a good loop if you if you think about it, how it all works together. And like you say, you need all types of thinkers. You need all types of thinkers. And the first step I tell business leaders is you have to realize that these different kinds of thinkers exist. I thought everybody thought in picture stores in my late thirties. I was shocked when I found out that everybody did not think in pictures. That mm -hmm. was a shock to me. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I I really enjoyed your movie, The Temple Grandin, with um, Claire Danes, that really explained how all of that looked to you, um, growing up and and just learning that not everybody thought that same way. Well, she that movie shows visual thinking absolutely accurately. Mm -hmm. Also, the projects I worked on were shown accurately, and they were all built. Replicas were all made off of original drawings. Great. Yes, it was. It was a really very enlightening. And informative. They did a great job with that. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Well, I really appreciate your time here today. Are there any last messages you would like to give to our women in agribusiness? Well, there's a lot of kinds of all kinds of opportunities today. And one of the things I did is I made myself really good at what I did. Another thing is I saw doors to opportunity. There's a scene in the HBO movie where I walk up to the editor of our state farm magazine. I would have been in my early 20s. And I asked for the card because I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would help my career. That C, a door. And mm -hmm. I became livestock editor for seven years. That helped my career a whole lot. It helped with my credibility. Right. And you have to have the guts to go up and ask for the card. And I'm concerned today that students today spending too much time online won't have the guts to ask for the card. Right. And I went up and I got the card and I produced a good article. Then I approached them about doing a column. Six months later, I was livestock editor. And that get me press passes in the big expensive meetings. I couldn't afford to go to otherwise. <laughs> you see, that's seeing doors to opportunity. And then you gotta have right. the guts to go up there. And he just happened to be at a cattle event, a little tiny cattle event. I don't even know why he was there. And and I, yeah, doors to opportunity. Yeah, right. right. Sit next to somebody on a plane. I yeah. have the guts to get the conversation going. Right. Yes. I and I, I, I'm more of a word girl, so I love to do that. I'll, I'll <laughs> my children will say, "Stop talking to people," and I think it's a great way to, to move life forward. Well, you see, and, there's, and I think the other thing is, that a lot of autistic people uh, interview badly. Let's try to bypass that. Use the back door. Half mm -hmm. of all good jobs are back door. 
right like going up and to the editor and getting his card meeting people at, at a at a meat industry meeting and then getting jobs out right. I saw those opportunities yes so go through that open door then and that's what i'm going to do that's what really the uh, latest movie is about an yeah. open door and, and i feel very strongly about you know talking to young people and and helping them i just talked to a student today she had a good solid job and i you know she wanted to get her master's degree and i said your job has got health insurance and everything i think you need to work on your master's degree part-time mm -hmm. uh, at your local university right right it's and it's nice to give that outside uh, perspective and on the phone with 45 minutes today with her yes well that's great and i i really appreciate your time today and i know our audience is very excited to see you when we come to your 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 place of work in Colorado and Denver in the September and yep. look forward to seeing you there at the members only event and um, getting the book and and watching the documentary so well thank you so much for having me on your on your program today and I hope I've given people some ideas because um, there's a lot of uh, young women that are going to be the leaders of the future. And I saw some of them out there on that construction site. I was very, very happy. And he picks out the go-getters. Absolutely. Well, yep. it's wonderful. And thank you for helping pave the way for... Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Temple. Right. Yeah. Bye. Bye. -bye.